Good morning, Rhode Island. Good morning. It is fabulous to be back. In my opening words, I'd like to say something profound. We just uh, uh, went through a very high level of turmoil in Congress. What we get to do here at the local state level is going to put America back on its feet in a very significant way. And what I'd like to do today is to stitch together for you human health, the built environment, and the next economy. They all tie together. People can't walk. They cannot have health. We have the insight from our years of experience to bring back that help, and that's what my presentation will be about. So I'd like to start by telling stories. I'm a storyteller. A gentleman standing in the left path perhaps imagines his community should look act like what he sees, where people know one another, they go out, they uh, have great main streets, it's a, it's a prosperous town and so on. And we all wish that, but that gentleman is standing in La La Land. That's the Disney world. The real world, because we took our eyes off the prize, became something much different. We spend more time in the car than we would like to. We rush our child or grandchild across the street. We look out on some of the suburban mess, and we're not proud of it. And yet it's 80% of the built America. And then we get older, we realize we forgot to ask for a sidewalk. It's not up to our cities to provide it, we have to ask. Because cities are always uh, being lobbied by those who would prefer not to put them in, we have to ask. I think it's important to point out that I go to any city in America and see scenes like this. This is where I worked for 16 years, one is in the Florida Department of Transportation. Every year another person would lose their life here. But the very sad thing is, college students had to own a car just to get across this. This is Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, that road would actually work better with two fewer lanes. It would move more cars, but our engineers, while we've been thinking bigger, always win. And it does. It almost always loses. To make my point, you may not be able to guess where this is. I know it'll surprise you. Notice the sign says, walk. <laughs> the bike lanes say, bike. But nobody is built it. Most people are sitting for 20 minutes to get through this one intersection. This is the final approach to a high school in Malibu. Think about that. What have we done to ourselves? How do we get out of that mess? And so I like to say, it's this conference, each of you in this room, that are going to start to figure out the pieces, stitch them together, and bring back the real America. It's time. And I'd also like to plant a few seeds in this presentation that every future dollar that we spend in transportation has to increase land value. It can never subtract. We can't afford that. One might say we never could have afforded it, but we got ourselves into the pickle that we're in. We bring back main streets. We bring back places in our own neighborhoods that have value and character and work. And we do that by understanding the language and stitching it together. So speaking of language, all five of these people are doing exactly the same thing. Study for a moment what they're doing. And then give me a word. What are they doing? Well, they are. Uh, in Europe, we would call that lingering. It's a very popular word. But in our country, that's loitering. <laughs> we even reinvented the language when we decided public place is not a worthy thing for us to work on. The Europeans don't have that word loiter. They have the word linger, and it's a measure of success. We also can look out. <laughs> Enough said. So let's talk 
talk about who are the best designers of cities and how do they do it. Key West, Florida. The 20% of the land mass that uh, you see here was built by which designers? Which designers laid out the bill of Key West? Pirates. On average, how many years of design school did the pirate go to? And that's my point. They use common sense. Keep that word in mind. That's going to drive the entire presentation. And so putting everything at a human scale, walkable, narrow streets, good block farm, plazas, churches, everything you see here, this now makes 80% of the money for all of Key West, and yet it's only 20% of the land mass. The rest of Key West looks like this. The streets don't break. The seawall has not been maintained since Hemingway once walked there. What are you going to do if you get off of this bus? Best bet, swim to Cuba. <laughs> and what in the world does that arrow mean anyway? <laughs> and here's my point. This was designed by standards. Fear of court liability. Whatever reason we come up with, it's not built with common sense. And therefore, virtually anyone in this room is a better designer than anyone who follows a court. And we'll talk about that. But we have to keep in mind some of the trends in our country. And by the way, the, the current and future trends are powerful. They're leaning in the right direction. People want fled cities for their health. Truly did. Today, and as of 30 years ago, they're coming back to cities because cities are healthier places. And they always will be from here on out. And so where do we want to say it all began? The point is it's all built around transportation. Always cities were designed around whatever the transportation of choice at the time. Walking, aided later by a donkey, a horse, a mule later by a trolley, a tram, a canal, anything. And today, it's still true. We're going to get back modern transit. We're going to get back walking, bicycling, and they will continue to allow us to figure out how to invest in our cities. Now, the thin 60 years where that wasn't true. Those 60 years did a heck of a lot of damage. And now, we get in the prime years of our lives to make it work because we know the alternative has not been working. So if you want a scene like this in your town, if you want more jobs, if you want greater health, then this is what you want. And it should be natural. And this is Madison, Wisconsin, a very cold city, but they started working on walkability and active transportation 30 years ago, and this is the path. The good news is, there's a paradigm shift, and that paradigm shift, every single thing you see here, and the one I want to focus on is our aging boomers. I'm a pre-boomer, 69. Uh, but all of us who are entering this era of our lives are not going to want to drive to we still want to drive. We'll outlive our ability to drive, by the way, 7 to 14 years. If you're a male, 7 on average. If you're a woman, 14 on average. Because of medical care and all other things. If we're not building a walkable community, we're not going to have a great ending in life. Now, we also know that our boomers, as they, they, they hit the, uh, the great surge, are not going to want to drive on the Peacock. We've been designing everything around the Peacock. And, and this is good news, as well as the Millennials, and we'll talk about that more. So I have had the great pleasure for the last three years to work in over 40 communities for the AARP. It's a fabulous thing for me to be able to do. I've really gotten into the ability to bring about great change by working with great people, one person at a time, who gets it, who's ready to start to bring change in their community. And I want to tell the story of the first community I got to work in, called Gulf Shores. It's in Alabama. 
We were leaving a walking audit. It's a powerful tool. And after talking with the group uh, here, we declared this was a great place for our builders. People wouldn't have to walk as far or drive as far or bike as far. Later in that afternoon, I found out that this road was to be transformed into this road to become a five-lane road. And so that night, presenting, I showed this image, I said, is this what you want? And I kid you not, sitting in the front row, just off to my left, was the traffic engineer for the town, Kit. And Kit started to cry. I had never seen a traffic engineer cry. <laughs> so I asked Kit, Kit, why are you crying? And she said, Dan, we're at 90% plans completion. They're mixing up the concrete. I said, is that what you want, Kit? And she looked up at me and said, no. I said, then I give you permission to change it. She did. She went to the Alabama DOT. They started over, and this is what they're going to get. This is the power of AARP, right here in one of them. You can do this, but you have to bring the community together. You don't want to go to the to the state and say, let's change it and be alone. You have to have your community with you. Now there was something else that we were able to do for Gulf Shores. This is a 12 square mile nature preserve. It's a restoration area for nature. It's where the water goes after a hurricane. And it's a, they cannot tamper with this. So I suggested, you know, you'll never build a road through here and you still have to have hurricane evacuation. Why not put in a bicycle? A walking track. So I created this image for them and said this is what it would look like, but it has to be 14 feet wide. Why did I say it had to be that wide? For vehicles, when the hurricane comes. And this now gives us an extra route out of town. It only gets used once every five years. We hope only every 20 years. But the point is, we need an extra way out of town when the hurricane hits. And now, we can use FEMA money to build a recreational trail. And truly, uh, this is my key point, is we have to spend money in ways that give us five benefits, not one. That era is gone. We have to use money more effectively. One of the next projects we worked on for AARP is Mount Bio. The first all African American community in America, in fact, uh, uh, the former slaves uh, were ready to break free before the Civil War started. And this was the town they would have found it. The war occurred, they then left, and they're very proud to have created this community. It's got some of the greatest histories in America. Uh, they could not get medical care. No one would give that to them. So they built their first hospital, their own hospital. And then no one would insure them. So they formed their own insurance company. When people wanted to go, say, from New Orleans to Detroit, there was no place they could go to the bathroom in America. And so this town opened its doors, its restaurants, its lodging. Mount Bio, and when we went and worked there, they didn't have high hopes for anything, but they wanted to remember their history. So we helped them do that visually to bring back the heart and center of the town. And the project they built is incredible wayfinding and historic markers to celebrate the greatness of their people working together for a long, long time. So let's get into the nitty gritty. I'm not a person who likes to get into lots of technical things, but I think you're going to see that uh, building a walkable community, again, is still about common sense. If you want to walk, you've got to have fine grain streets. You can't have cold sacks that just go on forever. You need uh, places to go to. Uh, that means big is not good. Uh, we need small brochures, and green brochures, and, and uh, a little markets and so on. So if you follow these basic rules, you've got a walkable community. And Providence, as an example, is a very walkable community. They got uh, Diane gave me a, 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 a ride through, I think, what was it, over 120 neighborhoods, Diane? A lot of neighborhoods, yeah. Uh, yesterday, we're going to go out some more today and, and, uh, uh, and enjoy the day. But the point is, if you evaluate your own neighborhood, wherever you live, 
This is what you should be looking for. But this is what we built. And just take one concept, street connectivity. If your streets don't connect, it looks like the picture on the bottom. You can't walk. You might walk up and down your block. But you need street connections. You need the right block path in order to walk. So why do I do what I do? I started when I was 20 years old. I read the last great writing of John Steinman, Travels with Charlie. Story of he and his pet dog, Charlie, who, uh, who uh, John knew he was dying. He was about 65, I believe, and knew he wouldn't live more than two more years. So he wanted to reconnect with his America. It was what he wrote at the end of that book that has always stayed with me and changed the course of my life. He basically said, America is out of sync with its values. We say we're for children, we're for beauty, we're for aesthetics, whatever it is, and we're not doing that. So when we look out our car windows and see this, we realize we've got misplaced that. We're, we're really building for steam, for efficiency, for one thing to move. So I celebrate all of you working together to get the complete streets going. And to understand what they mean, and I'll explain a little bit more, it's not going to cost more money, it's going to set a new economy that's more affordable. And that's the point. To have sidewalks, to have bike lanes, is not expensive. We already own the right of it. We're not going to do anything extraordinary. So, let me give you a picture of what I think walkability is. It's not sidewalks. Well, that's a part of it. It's having a place to walk to in your own neighborhood that you can join someone for lunch or, or for breakfast or whatever. It's having homes the right size, the right scale, and the right location so that you can afford to live in a, a, in a place that's got what you live for. It's taking on a project. I'm going to call this a complete street when you see the next image, this one. So it starts as this, notice the buildings are there, the street's already there, the right of way is there. All you do, and this can happen over a weekend, is people come out, they strip off the old asphalt, and they bring back the original uh, fabric, color, pageantry of the brick streets. And that's truly a complete example. And again, it can happen with a work effort of all people. In this case, that's Victoria. Now let's talk about also what is walkability. This scene is a typical street in, in a lot of neighborhoods. Notice it has a sidewalk. Is it walkable? I would be the first to say, heck, heck it's no. The sidewalk is immaterial here. Uh, maybe the block's only 500 feet long. And, uh, who's going to be watching over you? And uh, uh, now this street meets the needs of the fire service, meets the needs of the engineer, the town planner, everyone who plays their role says, I'll sign off on this. But it's not walkable, it's not livable, it's not healthy. Therefore, it's not sustainable. So let me show you what I think a walkable neighborhood would look like. Now notice here, the street's about the same width. The parking, uh, for the most part, uh, on the street. There also happens to be an alleyway and, and uh, a, a pleasant set of porches. This is very walkable because people are watching over every block, right? So, really important that we understand that today, many communities cannot know this. Because we've got one profession or another to say that street's not wide enough or uh, we have to have two off street parking spaces per house. And if that's what we want, that's what we get. But if we don't want that, we have to decide what is walkable. And maybe having ours is not such a bad idea as long as we design the crap. So I'm going to show you a few visuals. Brattleboro, Vermont, where I'll be working for the ARP later this year, uh, wanted a gateway. They wanted people who got off of the freeway to stay, to spend money. They wanted the jobs that would come by creating a place. And so we gave them a visual. 
And uh, now there's new tools here, and you may not want all of them. You may not want any of them. Uh, this is a roundabout. It's not a rotary. It's not a circle. It's a roundabout. It's a very different tool. It will save 90% of all crashes from ever occurring. It'll move 30% more traffic. It acts as a gateway. It slows everyone down. And there's head out back the park. Now, both of those are new tools. But they both work in the right location when people are ready for them. Or in a Canadian city, I do a lot of work in Canada. Uh, this is not what people want. This is built for the car. It's the strip. It's the suburb. This is what they want. And as people work together and they empower their, their counselors and their uh, developers, then this gets it. Uh, or this. It's the same town. Just look in the other direction. There's a dead mall here. And as we look at it, we realize we start with the street. The completing the street sets the stage for everything you're about to see. And again, this is where the dollar return comes in. You don't spend a lot of money to fix the street, but you spend some. That's the public side. That's the public investment. And you green it up, you create a sense of place, you slow down traffic, and then in time, you get the evolution where now you have the street, the buildings watch over them. We have many destinations. You can live here, shop here, work here, whatever, but it's now getting back to the original notion, the concept of what community is all about. Uh, again, these are all up in northern Ontario, places where I was just working last week. And again, I think you can see uh, going from a car focus to a people focus, and in this case, we can move 30 percent more traffic. That's the point. The complete street always serves multiple purposes. Or here, it's a main street. It's kind of drab, but in the future, we'll look more like this. Or Chunkate in the eastern shore of Virginia, where the ponies live, uh, they're not able to hold on to their turks. They see how ugly the town is. And they go to see the ponies, but then they get right out of Dodge. They don't want to be there in a longer. But if they just make this transformation, think of how many people would spend the night, spend more money, and help Chincote as a city come alive. This is bringing me up to your role and our relevance. Aging in place is simply no more than finding where we want to live and then make it a success. So this is the place my wife and I chose to move to Fort Townsend, Washington. It's like almost anywhere in Rhode Island, same size, same scale. We moved there because we wanted to get rid of our car. And we did. And so these are the scenes that are very ordinary in Fort Townsend. And this is uh, what I feel when I go to places like Newport, you know, places I'm familiar with, and uh, I truly bring back uh, what we want. We can find is the street. The street is the river of life. If we strip it of life, it's the river of death. Just like <coughs> Let me tell a few more stories. On the bottom, you see the great grandfather at age eight walked six miles to go fishing. The grandfather, the great grandfather was first, the grandfather, Jack, walked a mile. And then uh, the mother, Vicki, age eight, walked half a mile, and the son, Ed, at the age of eight, could walk to the end of school. What have we done to ourselves? And then, how do we get it? So, it's those of us in this room, and those we know to influence, that are going to bring it back. These are our greatest years, and we need to be most productive in getting the concepts back. And so I want to start with human health itself. Human health, if you can think back, there's never been a time when you did not want to walk. This is my grandson, Jack. About a week later, he could walk on his own. Today, Jack is six. He bicycles two miles to school every day. And he's very proud of that. And as a senior, the last thing we want, even if someone is there to assist us, we don't want to give up on walking. Give up on walking, we're giving up on walking. Now, we can go back to Socrates or anyone who way back was helping invent meditation and medicine. There has never, ever been a better prescription for 
human health than walking. Even if we're on medication, we can lighten the load by walking and making walking natural again. That's what we're talking about. But walking is a little more than having a sidewalk. Let's assume this neighborhood is one you live in. You could always put in the sidewalks and the crossings. That will help. You can put in the trees. But it is not until your town code calls for buildings to watch over the street that you finally feel secure and will walk out. Now, it's a fairly simple concept. But how many of our town codes are written just backwards? And this is what we're really going to need to straighten out in time so that we give ourselves this gift. We can see the difference. International Drive in Orlando looks, even to this day, like what you see in the upper sink. This is meant to be a front porch for the world, and yet it's not up to what it should be. The lower sink, which is in New England, West Hartford, Farmington Avenue, is a great street. And here you see it up close. This is why people go there. Even on a rainy day, the trees will accept the water and keep the sidewalks dry. And uh, now I want to come real close to home to Rhode Island, to Newport. Newport, a long time ago, looked like this. And uh, this is a well-connected street path. It has the right block on the right elements. And this is walkable. Everything we built for a purpose here. It had a railroad, it had steamships, it had everything. This is what it looks like today, same same. Now, it's not as bad as uh, most places I've been. It's a lot better. Um, but think about the things we've lost. We have open lot housing. We tried to bring in uh, the suburbs to downtown. That's not a good idea. We created super blocks. We put in parking garages again. Uh, not the worst location, but I think you can see any town success is tied totally to how many mistakes did you not yet make. Stop making mistakes. Every time you work with your community, make sure you're heading in the right direction. And uh, right now, I'm the first to say, and I believe it's called America's Cup, is the road? Take it down to two lanes. Put in roundabouts, and you'll move more traffic. And now people can walk freely across the street. Now you need the engineering, you need the math, but my eyeball says you move your traffic better if you weren't just stacking it up the way you are today. Today, the pedestrian is an impediment. You want people to park as soon as they can and not have to drive from place to place. And once you do that, it will work a lot better. But it's something you get to do. It's not something I get to do other than to say, I've looked at it, it looks on paper at least, that you can make this work. Meanwhile, keep adding to that placement. It's a beautiful community. It's one of my favorites in the entire nation. And uh, as I get to walk later today through Providence, I know I'm going to see many of the same scenes. I'm going to fall in love with almost anywhere. I love uh, the way you celebrate history, the culture, uh, the quiet, the tranquility, uh, I think in a given day there were a thousand weddings taking place. Am I right about that? I mean, people go there for a reason, and they come back for their anniversary for a reason, and they uh, bring their grandchildren there for a reason uh, because a lot of love went into its original concept. Now, I declare that the street has a great street. Probably no more than 100 in America right now, but this is a great one. And you might say, well, looking at this as an elder, it's got some challenges, yeah, every street does. But this one buffers the traffic. It puts eyes on the street. It gives us constant new variety. And uh, uh, even an Army Navy store, which we typically only see out in a supper, kind of fits in here because they were very tastefully thoughtful about what their appearance should be. There are a lot of little alleyways and uh, elevation changes that have been uh, enhanced. They're not perfect. Notice the, the uh, wire fencing and things like that. This, this is still ready. It's organic and it can be uh, uh, altered over time. But my walks in Newport have always led me 
to a very high level of comfort for what an ultimate community should be. Uh, where people know one another, where we celebrate our history, where we uh, understand the importance and the relevance. We put the trees in in a way that doesn't block the silence. This is a very, very well-crafted. We celebrate our history, and we do all the things that truly uh, help everyone keep the blocks, the intersections tight and narrow. Notice even the brick that you see here in the street is uh, keeping the motors from going around this turn too fast and uh, yet will allow for that very rare, very big, a large truck needs to make that turn. This is very thoughtful design. Now, a few more points. We're all totally tuned into the cost of government. For years, we only said, well, let's just try to find an affordable way to provide the service because people are going to get sick. All that's changed. Today, the goal is to keep people well. And that's what this whole presentation is about. Uh, notice, by the way, two things on this uh, bar graph. First, that's the per person cost of health care in America today. On average, 15000 per family. We can't afford that. But the lower charge, the one that frightens me the most, it's the rising pace at which our health care costs are going up. We can bring these way back down. I'm working on a program where we cut the health care costs for an entire community 40% because we made it an active living community. There are many reasons why we need walking communities. People need to be out, they need to socialize. Uh, we are way over prescribing depressive disorders. We're not just doing it for our seniors, we're doing it for our children. There's never been a society in the course of human history that's pumped more pills into children than what we're doing today. So what we do for our elders, we're also doing for our own youth, our own children. And so as I show these things, and we prescribe and work in getting the community together for, for our elders, that we're working for all people of all time. In Vernon, British Columbia, I go there to photograph and this is a very common thing. Uh, elders who are walking very long distances because we put the shopping near them. Uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, the same thing. In uh, uh, Charlotte, in uh, town after town after town, when we start to design for seniors, uh, we're accommodating all people, all time, and we're building, pumping a new economy. This is my town, Port Towns of Washington. And one of the reasons we live here is we've got the largest farmer's market per capita of any place in the nation. We love access to good food. We need to get back green groceries. But they can't come back if all we do is set our scale for the big box stores. And yeah, we might save some money. But we're really costing ourselves something that's very dear to us. By the way, when I look at what's a walkable community or, or a sign that could be coming back, this is one of my favorite. Um, you know, just looking for some shade, you roll up to town, you get free Wi-Fi, you kick off your shoes, and you're a happy camper. So you work for a better community, this is what you should see, income. And certainly this, that your grandparents come back. Maybe your children went off because they got good schooling and, and the only job in some big city. But maybe you create the place making so that your grandchildren now live where you do because it's a smaller town or smaller scale. You see scenes like this. And by the way, I always say that coffee houses are an indication that life is coming back to a community. Now, here's the good news, and there's a lot of good news. Americans are getting tired of driving. Indeed, uh, what they celebrated three weeks ago now in the Sunday Oregonian. Portland newspaper, is that this chart that you're about to see unfolded is absolutely real. So somewhere around 2004, that upward climb that was going on forever on peak vehicle miles traveled in the mega billions of miles broke. It had nothing to do with gas prices. It had nothing to do with the economy. Indeed, as we go further out, you see the pre-trend on top. 
You also see the 1987 trend. Something was starting as far back as 1987. And then you see the 2004 trend. It was already coming down. And then you see the post-2007 trend. It's coming down even more. And then you look at the millennial generation. The desire to buy is plummeting. And the youngest people among us are the first to say, I'm not going to get a driver's license until later. They don't. They'd rather tweet than drive. <laughs> and we know that. And uh, so just taking one thing, communication, used to look like what's on the bottom. Today it looks like what's on the top. And it's in, instead of hanging out like we did in the 80s, <laughs> these people are probably just tweeting one another. <laughs> right? They're sitting there, but they're having fun doing it. We've changed. And here's some more of the good news. We can't afford, can't even come close to afford, to just trying to pave our way out of this. Indeed, during our most prosperous years, 20 full years, we could only add 2% to the road stop. That's all the money or land we have. We grew our demand to drive five times faster than the population. Those were the silly years. Those were crazy years. Today, for the next 20 years, if we could build all the money we allow us to build, we wouldn't even get one in 20 years. The land's not there, the costs are extraordinary and they're going up. So don't build more of the same. Don't do the same thing you were doing. Go for a new economy, build a place. And as we build a place, we bring back the jobs. And as we build a place, we make money. This is uh, the screen on the right. My friend Linda Polanski bought an entire building, a hotel, 40 shops, with $150,000 debt. She worked for the city. They turned the street into place. Well, by the end of the year, she's worth $15 million off of a $150,000 investment. So she bought the next block. <laughs> and at the end of that year, that street looked like this. Now she's worth $30 million off of a $150,000. So she bought the next block. Do you see where I'm going with this book? This is the start of South Beach. Linda had the perfect time and perfect knowledge of what people wanted before anyone else. And she retired with $45 million off of a $150,000 Now, we all can't do that well. But with good leadership in any community, you can do this one. This is West Palm Beach. Mayor Nancy Graham realized that the last people that had any money had left town. The drug dealers were still there. The prostitutes were still there. Gunfights would occur almost every night on these streets. She pulled together a charat, an interactive workshop. I got to be part of it. And six minutes, six minutes, <laughs> six years later, this is what it looks like. I'm here to share with you that once people start working together, we can resuscitate almost any place, but we have to be thoughtful. Now, they took out 17 travel lines in a town that was already dead. And the traffic engineers said, Take out 17 travel lanes, this town will die. <laughs> it's already not bad. You can only do better, but by building place, traffic works better. Because people don't drive as far. Another street in um, West Palm Beach, you can see we took five lanes down to two. And when we did, because the pedestrian doesn't need to take as long to get across the street, we can more and more green time to the through traffic. So traffic works better with fewer lanes in this case. But here's the dramatic result. Five minutes either side of the walk. For two and a half miles, along the corridor, every home went up in value $110,000 in one year. Build walkable communities, and you get back your economy. Now, I'm running low on time, so I want to skip forward just a little bit. You do that. I had to tell the story here. 
is his hand, the York. And uh, we took this street and we did everything that the engineers didn't want us to do. We narrowed the lanes. We put in six foot parking lanes, but look what we also put in a buffer, a transition, so you can get safely in and out of your car. Now, it's not wide enough for a bike. And, uh, but what we did is brought the speeds down so low through the design that the bicyclist is actually going slightly faster than the traffic. <laughs> we took out every traffic signal. Uh, one more will come out. Uh, four signals went out, roundabouts went in. And uh, now I think you can see it. So the question you should ask is, well, what about when a big truck is parked and another big truck comes by? The lanes are only nine feet wide. We broke another rule there. This is a major truck route. This is a New York DOT road. And here's the worst case scenario. The truck is making a delivery. Another one comes by. Big deal. We still accommodate every vehicle. This is a completed street that is now rated number two in America by the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. But the better news is this town, instead of pulling nine building permits per year, is pulling 99. It's a small town, and all merchants are making at least 30% more money. More businesses are moving in. This town used to be rated number 12 out of 12 villages. They're now rated number two. They put on more events every year than anyone else in their entire region. They use new tools. This is a roundabout fitted in a tiny, tiny space, and it works. We really struggled to get this one in, but it became part of the answer. It's more friendly for pedestrians. Instead of crossing 40, 50 feet, 60 feet sometimes, you're crossing 12 or 14. These are brand new buildings. You have places to go to now, and the traffic's moving better. And I think the whole point is, this is an era of brand new tools. It's an era of new excitement, new inspirations, new innovations, things that were born in America, like the roundabout, and come back to America after growing up in Europe. We're now talking about what do you do? What do you take home from this? You can pick any one of these, pick dozens of others, and if all you do is show up to celebrate your victory, you're great. But if all you do is learn a little more about a topic, so that you can keep your community focused uh, uh, or come to a training or orientation, whatever you do, there's a role for you to play. I want to also close with this one. Where is the future of our nation? A week ago, I was in Bend, Oregon. Not a large place, small place. And I watched these children walking by with some school teachers. And every once in a while, they stop and they draw. And they get up and they move and they stop and draw. And I asked the teachers, what are you teaching the children to do? And they said to me, Dan, these are the future designers of our cities. These children are learning how to design a city. We can do better than just have pirates. We can have our own children. And it should be the grandparents that lead these walks. Because we know how to make things work. And I'll close with just a few other final messages. Uh, America's happiness has been flatlined since the Depression. We are no happier today than during the Great Depression. There was a blip of happiness in the 60s. <laughs> we don't know why. <laughs> but Alexander von Humboldt understood that happiness depends more on how we embrace things than the things occurring around us. We are in charge of change, and if we are in charge of change, we have the purpose of life. Not only do we live longer, we live happier. Thomas Jefferson and Alexander von Humboldt used to hang together. Whenever the clipper ship would sail in, they would get together for a day, a weekend, a, a week. And Tom Jefferson really nailed it. If we're to have a working democracy, we have to have an informed public. And that's where the goodness of your organizations and your efforts will help change the future. And just to share with you how challenging this is, the street on the left, all unfolded completely, the Michigan DOT, realizing in Sault Ste. Marie that they needed a sidewalk, went in to offer a sidewalk on the left-hand side, which is the side everyone lives on. 
300 people showed up to kill the silent on the basis that they're rural. They didn't want to look rural, the sidewalk turf. Folks, we have to get over this. If we need a sidewalk, we need a sidewalk. If we need trees, we need trees. We don't need people thinking what rural is. Rural is urban in a better form, but protecting and preserving nature because we build to the right form. That means we use a more elaborate process. Uh, it, uh, again, we refer to the concept of a charrette. That's how we get people from very uncommon backgrounds to come together. And I'll finish with this story. The gentleman leaning over the table, when we put together this workshop, came to me and said, Dan, I want to oppose this project. And uh, I said, well, Terry, we don't give speeches. Join a table. Work with your friends and me. We did. He turned out to be the one who presented for his table. And he became convinced, working with his friends and neighbors, that building this road better to make it a complete street was a profoundly great idea. He sold the concept, not only in that room that day, but to the Rotarians and uh, other business groups. And he went on to defend evolving and developing other streets into real place. And Terry became the hero from the town because he came to listen and learn. And with that, folks, I want to thank you profoundly from the depths of my heart for allowing me to be here as your keynote presenter. Thank you.